So hello and welcome to a special program, a partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Erie Civil War Roundtable, and the Jefferson Educational Society. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and am a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Our guests for this conversation, that partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Erie Civil War Roundtable, and the JES are Mr. Michael Krauss, a curator of the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Mr. George Deitch, historian, author, and executive director of the Hagen History Center. With the Civil War in the rearview mirror, American, uh, American stage was set to bring romanticized versions of the conflict to theaters, the best known production being Shenandoah in 1889. Civil War themed moving pictures became extremely popular with over 200 newsreels produced between 1907 and 1916. These early plays and films shaped most Americans' view of the conflict and how it would be portrayed. Here, Mr. Krauss will draw on his experience, expertise, and knowledge to explore the Civil War on film, offering some of the behind the scenes look from an insider's perspective at Hollywood's treatment of the Civil War with Gettysburg and Cold Mountain and more in this presentation. Now, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, please still do feel free to send us your questions, your comments, and we'll get them along to Mr. Krauss and Mr. Deitch as we appreciate you being part of this conversation. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, please visit jeserie.org and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information from the Hagen History Center, please visit eriehistory.org and find them on the social platforms too. Now, I'd like to introduce the guest who's no stranger to the JES stage and digital programming who will introduce tonight's presenter. You may know him from his presentations on the Civil War and Erie history, or on the Cuban Missile Crisis, or on corrupt and contentious presidential elections, and or you may know him as the executive director of the Hagen History Center. Mr. George Deitch has co-founded several historical organizations related to the Civil War and the War of 1812 in Erie. He also helped create the flagship Niagara League, which played a central role in reconstructing the U.S. Brig Niagara and creating the Erie Maritime Museum. He is a prolific presenter and has been published in numerous journals and served as a consultant to National Geographic Magazine for its Civil War Sesquicentennial issue. It's my pleasure to turn things over by welcoming Mr. George Deitch here for this program in partnership. Thanks for being here. George, over to you. Thanks, Ben, and good evening, everyone. Tonight's session is titled Civil War on Film, Behind the Scenes of Gettysburg and Cold Mountain. Our presenter is Michael Krauss. I was honored to be asked to introduce Mike tonight. We've known each other for over 25 years and have worked together on several projects. Mike contributed as a historical consultant to several Hollywood films, which you'll be talking about Gettysburg and Cold Mountain tonight, and wrote and appears in the series Civil War Minutes and Civil War Life, which are currently available on Amazon Prime. Mike is the curator of the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in Pittsburgh. He's an accomplished sculptor whose works include a life the life-size bronze of Colonel Strong Vincent, which stands in Erie. Uh, Michael is, an active, is active in monument restoration work, including sculpting and installing missing pieces uh, from the uh, Colonel Nagel and Colonel Chris statues at Antietam National Battlefield. Um, in 2000, he restored the twins bronze statues of Erie's Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Perry Square. His latest project for me at the Erie County Historical Society is a monumental bust sculpture of Oliver Hazard Perry created and altered from a mold of the original statue located in Rhode Island. The Perry bust will be installed um, at the History Center in 2021 on a pedestal just outside the front entrance of our visitor center. Most recently, Krauss was awarded a commission to create a monument on the Antietam battlefield to Michigan troops that fought there, which is slated for completion in 2022. Mike holds a BFA and Distinguished Alumni Recognition from Edinburgh University. Uh, he taught at Gettysburg College for a semester as an adjunct professor of art. Uh, Mike has also been a reenactor since 1996 and is currently captain of the 116th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry part of the famous Irish Brigade. So um, with that, Mike, I'll turn it over to you and uh, we'll all 
um, find out more about Civil War on film. Thanks. Thank you, George. It's always a pleasure to work with you and all the projects we've done. Um, they're interesting, rewarding, and, and we're going to leave a mark. So that's really good. So my presentation tonight is about the Civil War on film. Um, and I want to start by, by looking at the history, looking back to how Civil War was presented on film, uh, going way back to the early days of film. And then I want to take us uh, through my experiences as a consultant on the uh, films of Gettysburg and Cold Mountain. So um, with that, I want to go move ahead. And I, I want you to look at this, this little um, saying here. Uh, and, and I actually don't know who, who, uh, whose quote it is, but I, I like it. And it kind of fits what we're doing tonight. Culture's myths serve two functions at once. They commemorate the past, but also disguise it. So keep that in mind as we go through and we're looking at American culture and we're looking to commemorate the past. And in some instances, we actually disguise it or alter it. So how was the Civil War, um, how was the Civil War uh, presented in popular culture? And you know, right after the war, uh, there, were, there were commercial products like uh, especially uh, uh, reprints of Harper's Weekly. Uh, there was a, a two volumes called Our so Soldier in the Civil War. There was a Union and Confederate version and basically they reprinted a lot of the uh, woodcuts and stories that were, um, that were from the war and it was, it was tremendously popular. Also another way that um, people learned about it or commemorated it in those days were regimental histories that were published by veterans or veterans organizations and those encapsulated the history of perhaps just one unit. Uh, there were novels with the war's background and personal recollections started to be uh, narrated and collected. So these are important ways of how, how it starts to pop up. So how does it move to the stage? Well, first of all, on the stage, there are common themes and these themes are also gonna go from stage to film. And those themes are valor, romance and history. And you'll see them pop up from all the, all the way through. They're just gonna be an element that um, becomes a storyline for basically all Civil War films and other films as well, they're historical films as well. But if we look at the stage, the, there are two early um, uh, productions. One was, the first one is credited as uh, held by the enemy in 1886 and um, Shenandoah, which is something that has kind of stood the test of time uh, was written and produced first in 1889. Uh, this is a poster from from a uh, uh, from the um, one of the productions, uh, and you can see it's a this is like a life size piece. It's it's about five feet tall, and this uh, these posters would actually have the name of the show uh, printed and then um, tipped in on the bottom. Uh, with the performance dates of what they were, but uh, you can see here we have, you know, we have the the, the valor, the romance, and and history all combined. And I've I've always been interested. I, I was attracted to this poster. It hangs in my house uh, because it is um, somewhat uh, very authentic in some parts. His belt buckle, his kepi, his gear. Uh, the woman's dress is more like a prairie style from the 1870s. But regardless, this is how. Uh, the war is going to start to be presented in images and in, in, in acting. So we go to uh, moving pictures and um, the introduction first was through newsreels and Ben uh, made the comment and it's true that between 1907 and 1916 there were 259 newsreels that contained Civil War, um, Civil War themes that were produced. That's a lot of newsreels and a lot of interest in the war. So you can see that it was very popular because um, these people are going to make, make uh, products that are going to sell. The, the filmmakers want to sell them so, uh, and have audience to see them. So this is, a, uh, this is uh, a test to the number that were being produced. So the very first Civil War films you're going to see, um, of course, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin would have to be uh, not only was it one of the very first books that ignited the war, but it's gonna be um, one of the very first films that comes out of the early age of film. 
and look, just look at the numbers as we look through here. Uh, from 1908, 13 Civil War films. 1909, 23 Civil War films. 1910, 34 Civil War films. And, uh, and by, there's nearly 100 of them produced um, uh, through the, every year through 1916. So it's ramping up. It's really, really getting big. So early movies, uh, they reach out to project the era within the narrative of the love story in the South as an underdog. Uh, you, this is something that, you know, it's just, a, a, again, another very typical element that um, you're going to see the South as an underdog. And we'll talk about that as we go through some of these films. The uh, probably the most famous and the most um, influential film was D.W. Griffith, Birth of a Nation, came out in 1915. It was three hours and 10 minutes long. The original title of it was The Klansman. So um, we know that there's a, a, a story behind that. And um, Griffith uh, was a son of a Confederate officer. And he used to listen to his uh, father tell stories. And he was very excited by those stories. And he became a storyteller uh, in film. And uh, he did a lot of Civil War work before this. But Birth of a Nation is the first film that, uh, that uses um, lots of reenactors and, um, and props. And uh, it's just a huge, huge film. This is a scene from, uh, from Birth of a Nation. And you see um, the main character, a southerner, standing on the parapet, about to enter the enemy's works. Uh, and don't forget, you know, the whole scene, the whole, the whole story is about um, the South and, and the birth of a nation, this new nation uh, that um, Griffith is exploring. So his battle scenes were really complicated. He hired army consultants. He used uh, uh, original gear, guns, and things like that. We'll talk about authenticity later. But it really made an impact. And don't forget, in the year it came out, there were still a lot of Civil War veterans. And th these are some of the people that are going to go to see the film. But remember that quote uh, about disguising the past? Um, so these early films create, they, they were very formative in creating harmful uh, stereotypes of African Americans. They fostered the lost cause. We talk a lot about the lost cause now. Um, because we're just starting to understand what an impact it had on history. Um, it has the Moonlight and Magnolia sanitized view of the Old South. It, um, these early films disguise the path by showing Northerners as aggressors who started the war. And I know there's some of you out there that, that uh, are, are going to pick up that um, and, and, and could, would argue that point as being true. But I'm going to ride with, uh, it's just, it's just part of the disguise that uh, these films are putting, uh, putting over. Cavaliers and Knights protecting their way of life, a typical um, element again, especially uh, looking at Southern culture and looking at reconstruction as evil. And a lot of these early films that have a Southern uh, bent to them uh, look, do portray reconstruction as evil. Um, Authenticity in the Civil War. Uh, so these early films, there's a lot of veterans around when the first films were first being made. So they, uh, the, the producers and directors uh, wanted to produce an authentic um, film. Uh, Griffith claimed he used a lot of uh, books to uh, back him up and historians. Of course, he, he, he picked his own path to how to interpret that. Um, authenticity was relevant. To, to him and to making a, a good film. And there was a, a large, you know, as far as supplies and props, there's a large supply of Civil War equipment uh, that could be used for props uh, laying around and that was uh, picked up and used. But as the decades passed, um, so did the need to portray uh, accurate uniforms or, or civilian clothing. They became very stylized. Hollywood created a Confederate soldier template as well as the uh, inaccurate uh, interpretation of what slavery looks like. Gone with the Winds, great example. Tara, the house back there, didn't exist. Uh, uh, they, uh, 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 David Oselznik uh, had his people scouring the South looking for 
a colonnaded plantation and he couldn't find it. So they, uh, they just built this in, in, uh, to, their own, to their own standards and their own uh, design and it became Terra and, and a symbol of uh, the Southern plantation. Uh, Gone with the Wind has some um, great scenes. This is the wounded in Atlanta um, and it's a very impactful scene, uh, but it really, it really is showing um, the defeat of the South and uh, the end of the, the culture uh, that is going to be Gone with the Wind. Harmful Stereotypes. Um, this is uh, the Mammy and uh, Scarlett O'Hara. And, uh, you know, she, she won an Academy Award for this performance. It was a great performance. Uh, but looking at some of the other characters, the African-American characters, uh, especially the character of Prissy, um, I, I read a great, a great little tidbit that uh, Malcolm X uh, said in all the uh, abuses of African-Americans in film, the depiction of uh, Prissy hurt him the most. This, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, nonchalant little girl. It was all the stereotypes that, that, um, that he hated and, 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 and became adopted in um, quite a lot of uh, American filmmaking and idea and culture. So uh, I know this isn't the most authentic film picture here, but I just wanted, while we we're talking about authenticity in film, uh, to bring in these three characters and, and as a historian looking at um, their gear and what Hollywood had available to them, uh, and some of you will notice their, uh, uh, their rifles, our original rifles, uh, the belt plate um, uh, that Mo is wearing is original, the one that uh, Curly is wearing is a fantasy plate, it's a CSA, those were made up um, in the uh, early 1920s and continue to, to be uh, seen in pop-up and collector markets. Uh, their caps are good. The officer's equipment is really good. He has a, it looks like an original cap box he's wearing. But uh, this is, again, not only showing some of the available things that, that, uh, that uh, were laying around in the prop department, but also the popularity of the subject of the Civil War. So we come into the post-World War II era, and you get films like um, The Red Badge of Courage, starring Audie Murphy, who is a Medal of Honor recipient. Uh, friendly Persuasion, you get uh, television uh, series, North and South, and, and Roots, which isn't, you know, a, a Civil War film, but it really deals with the, the, uh, uh, the background of the war and, and why it's going to be relevant. So the modern interpretation of the war, these are, um, I just kind of brainstormed a few titles that were uh, you know, in our, in our rearview mirror, uh, Glory came out in eight, 1989, Gettysburg in 93, Gods and Generals in 2003, Cold Mountain 2003, The Beguiled uh, came out twice, Clint Eastwood was in the first one, 1971, 2017, Free State of Jones um, is probably one of the most recent, but look at Little Women, I, I mean, I know it's not a combat uh, movie, but it is a Civil War era movie, Look how many times it was made, 1917, 1918, 1933, 1944, 1994, and 2019, and they're probably not done with it yet. So now I'm going to talk about my experience, what it's like to work on a, on a Hollywood film. And um, the first film is, is Gettysburg, and I assume many of you have seen the film. It was a Turner Network production, and uh, it... Uh, it was filmed uh, in Gettysburg. Some parts were actually filmed on the battlefield. Uh, this is a, a poster from it and um, my crew pass, which got me into lots of places. I could go anywhere uh, being on the crew and uh, there's a ticket, a, a world premiere ticket. Um, being, I was a, a historical consultant. I was one of, um, in the beginning, just one of two, myself and Brian Pohanka. Uh, we're both uh, tapped to be historical consultants, and that let us uh, be behind the camera with the director on set, uh, managing um, managing uh, what people uh, were needed to be uniformed in, how they were uniformed, making decisions on who would be in the front ranks and the in the back ranks, and you know we made it a better film. You didn't catch everything, but um, we had a lot of uh, latitude in what we were able to do. 
So that's Ted Turner right there. Um, he made an appearance in the film um, as a Confederate officer crossing the Emmitsburg Road. And um, the camera lingers on him for a minute or two while, while he gets shot. And uh, this was a day when uh, they did publicity. That's me standing um, with my back to, to him. Um, but he walked around and, and um, told everybody he was from Ohio. He was born in Ohio. And he wanted to like say that he was a northerner, even though he's a southerner. This is um, during filming. Uh, uh, you may be familiar with uh, not only the actual site, but this site in the film. This is the angle. Um, this was filmed about two or three miles away from Gettysburg on a farm on Bullfrog Road. And uh, in the background, you can see um, the explosions. That's where the filming is, is happening. These are uh, parts of the shooting of Pickett's Charge across the, the road. Uh, the walls were all built, especially for the film. They were aged to look like they, they'd been there for a while. And, you know, you would be... Uh, we would be up on one end of the field, they'd be filming on the other end of the field. So uh, there was a lot going on, a lot of production. Um, I see here, this is one where they were getting one of the cannons ready that was going to be in, right in the angle. Uh, this is uh, a, a Mort Kunstler um, painting of, uh, of the attack at the angle. Um, Kunstler was uh, the, the artist in residence on the site. He made a lot of sketches um, during the production that were turned into a book. Um, so uh, when I look at this, I actually can see people who I knew in their faces um, that were in the filming and Kunstler has rendered them as, as part of a, a period drawing. You'll notice in the background, that's the Vermont Brigade going out to uh, flank the, the, the uh, Confederate advance uh, in the background. This is a Turner, uh, Turner production still shot that they took. Uh, right at the angle when uh, the breach was going to happen. Uh, and what happened, uh, not only for the film, but in, in, rea in real life, is uh, once those, once those um, numbers, those uh, advancing troops start coming across the, film, the field and they get smaller and smaller, they start realigning and getting tighter and tighter until they're almost clumping together. That last 50 to 75 yards, they were just looking to punch a hole and the same thing happened. Um, the same thing happened in the film that happened uh, actually uh, for real. And you can see the character of Armistead. He's in the center on the top of the wall there, uh, behind one of the flags. Richard Jordan, um, who was going to uh, then make his way to uh, to one of the guns of Cushing's battery. So every day when you're on when you're on a film, there's a call sheet, and uh, you pick up a call sheet, and the call sheet tells you. Um, the set, what you're doing, the scenes you're doing that are coordinated through the script, the, the uh, cast that's required to be there that day, the players, um, uh, when, they're, when they're coming, uh, when the cast is coming, because they had to be brought out, they had to get their makeup and, and uh, be brought out in limousines, and they had to be at a certain time and uh, be responsible. And then below was, uh, was kind of where I needed to look for um, atmosphere and stand-ins. It would, it would have things like, uh, like 300 Confederate infantry, 12 uh, mounted cavalry, uh, two cannons, one wagon. So I had to kind of round that stuff up and look over it and make sure that it all looked uh, okay and nobody was wearing you know, tennis shoes or had a watch on their wrist or um, glasses and those kind of mistakes that sometimes pop in a film and become a legend to people that look for those. This is one of the, um, one of the shots um, taken of the assembling for Pickett's Charge and the Confederate troops have just moved out of the wood line uh, and they're about to go through uh, the row of the, the line of guns, Confe or Confederate artillery. And they're getting some instruction here of what they're doing, but this was a fabulous um, seen to be in and to, and to watch unfold. I mean, we had almost uh, 2,000 people uh, on the set doing that and all with, uh, you know, weapons and uniforms and flags and, and mounted officers. And uh, it was really um, quite, uh, quite a thrill to be part of, um, as well as, um, as, as making a good scene in the film. I, I doubt whether this could be done today because there aren't as many reenactors anymore. Um, 
And, um, you know, most of them look like me with white hair instead of brown hair. Uh, and we have our bellies that we bring with us too. Um, so, uh, you know, the look of a Confederate soldier or, or any soldier at that time would have been very lean and young. This is a, a film, uh, a scene being filmed of uh, the rush from the Emmitsburg Road towards the angle. That's me on the right. I was uh, dressed in a Confederate uniform. I was watching for um, accidents to happen. Um, if something happened, we were using real bayonets and there are explosions going on all over the place. So if somebody got trampled, uh, accidentally stuck a bayonet in somebody, dropped a rifle and somebody lunged into it, I, I would be able to run out without interrupting the filming and kind of uh, give a triage as to whether, uh, whether we needed to stop or, or keep going. Um, you know that Martin Sheen played uh, Robert E. Lee. Uh, Sheen didn't take the role until a few days before um, the production and his part started to be filmed. Uh, there were a number of other actors being considered. They had other commitments. Duvall was one of them. Um, Sheen uh, came um, and was very friendly. He talked to lots of people. Uh, in fact, they had to kind of drag him off the field sometimes because they needed him and he was busy kind of talking to the common man, which is something he's really well known for. And this is a pretty famous um, scene in the movie where Lee is, rides out to his troops and they start, you know, pumping their fists and yelling, Lee, Lee, Lee. And I have to tell you that um, that scene was not scripted. That was that scene happened the day that Martin Sheen put on his uniform, got on a horse, and rode out to to meet everybody. We were all standing there uh, filming the Pickett's Charge scenes, and when he rode out, it was an electric moment. Everybody just kind of swirled around him and ran, and they were they were yet saying Lee, 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 and the look on his face says it all because he was terrified. He didn't know what was going on. Uh, but the director uh, asked right away to get the cameras out there, get the cameras out there and catch this. So this was a scene that was not scripted uh, and, it, and it, it appears in there and it's uh, kind of a great motivating scene in the, in the movie as far as the lead character goes. Um, these guys, these horses and guys, um, they're the easiest people to work with. When you lay them in a field, they stay there. They don't get up and crawl around. Um, the horses were, um, were Hollywood props. Their legs were broken. They've been used so many times. Uh, their skin was peeling off. The legs were broken. But what a, what a, great, uh, what a great prop it is. Um, one of the Wranglers told me that those horses had been in more Hollywood films than probably any actor uh, because they get used over and over again as background material. But in the morning, the, the prop guys, the set dressers would go out with the trailer and they start plopping bodies here and there in the field and plopping horses. And they knew where to, where to put them and where the camera would look. So uh, it, was, it was pretty fascinating uh, part of filmmaking to, uh, to witness. There was a tintype photographer there uh, taking stills uh, for the movie. Uh, you can see some of them. I can't remember if they're in the beginning or the end of the film. Um, but I posed for my, my shot on the left. Uh, it's a wet plate tintype. And I, somebody took a, a picture with a modern camera on the right at the exact same time. So you can see that uh, when you look at Civil War photos, the image is reversed. It's a mirror image. Um, and um, it gives you this haunting look in your eyes. And um, it's really quite a photo. Um, I, I really prize it from my days there. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually a you know, really authentic way to look at a photograph, a Civil War photograph and see the difference between modern photography and, and 19th century photography. Um, this was in the Pickett's Charge scene. The Pickett's Charge scenes took over a week to film. They were filmed in pieces. Um, it took a whole day to, to film scenes in the woods uh, with bombs blowing up, pieces of trees bre breaking. It took uh, several days to march out of the woods and stand there. It took a, a day or two to go through the guns. Um, and, and uh, the firing of the, of the uh, cannons. Um, it, it, these were all separate days and it, it just takes a long time to do that. But there was one day uh, we filmed actually on the battlefield. Um, and it was a difficult thing to do. The Park Service um, 
doesn't like to use the battlefield like that. And, and, and I kind of agree with not abusing the battlefield. Um, but it was, it was in order to get these uh, big panoramic shots coming across the field. And we started, um, we started over by the Lee Monument. And uh, we had, I can tell you this for a fact, we had 1,862 men participating in that, in that scene. And because I, I took the morning reports, I added them up, submitted them so everybody could get fed. When I saw the number 1862, I added my name to the list. So there were now 1863 uh, reenactors on the field that in that shot, the magic number. Um, I also was, uh, they, they afforded me the opportunity to be on a horse. And if, if you notice, this is the same horse that Lee was riding. There are about seven or eight horses that get used all the time in every scene. And if you're in a movie and if you get to ride on a horse, pick a white one because you can see yourself in the film really easy. And uh, in some of those scenes that move out of the woods, um, I'm, I'm on the horse and it's, uh, he was very lazy. He didn't care about explosions or, uh, you know, moving or, or flags waving. He just wanted to walk or not walk. So I had to really convince him sometimes to move. Um, but it was a great seat to be in on top of the, uh, in, in, that, in that charge. When we got to the fence, um, I was no longer on a horse. It was filmed um, another day after, uh, but I was uh, asked to to go with the stunt man to to run along with the stunt man, climb over the fence, the Emmitsburg Road fence, and as we got to the other side, we were to run to to the right in, in the direction down the fence, and this the the stunt man was going to step on an, on a charge and it was going to blow him up. Well, we, uh, this is a more Kunstler drawing, by the way, he captured this exact moment. When we went over the fence, the stunt man tripped over his sword and ended up on the ground. And um, the cameras are rolling. So I ran in the direction I was supposed to, not knowing where the explosion was. I stepped right on the damn thing and it blew up. Um, it looks, uh, in the film, it looks really good because it's a surprise and it was a surprise to me. So these, these, um, these explosions are a big steel pan, like a wok, like a Chinese cooking wok. And in them, they have uh, like uh, cork and sawdust and moss, and then an explosive underneath it. So when it's wired, it blows up. And uh, when I hit it, I, I thought I really got killed because all I saw was a flash. And I, I just went down and that, that little piece of film is cut into the charge two different times. Uh, because it was very convincing, and I survived. So the next film I, I was asked to take a, a part of was um, the film Cold Mountain, and that was released in 2003, and I know it doesn't have <clears throat> the following that Gettysburg has. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's based on a novel. Um, it's a great read. It's a great story. Um, there's one of the best descriptions of of, uh, of the Battle of Fredericksburg, even though it's a novel of a Confederate uh, character firing into the advancing Union troops, um, uh, which is not in the film, but it's a great description. Uh, but it was filmed, um, the, the starred uh, Jude Law and Nicole Kidman and Donald Sutherland and a whole host of uh, other stars, filmed in Romania, um, not in the United States. It was filmed by an English um, crew, Pinewood Studios, under the Miramax label. Um, uh, the director, Anthony Minghella, uh, sent a crew around the world looking for locations. They scouted the US. And he said that there was nowhere in the United States that didn't have the imprint that they looked at, that didn't have the imprint of the 20th century. And he meant like forests that had, had not, or were not mature or um, jet streams in the sky or no, ambient noises that they couldn't uh, work around. And they found Romania, which is um, very sparsely populated in some places. Uh, it was cheap to work there. Uh, labor was, was very reasonable. And um, the locations really worked out good. And, and they could really do just about anything because they didn't have, um, they didn't have the EPA or things like that uh, breathing down their necks about uh, and I'll show you some examples about some of the things that 
probably couldn't be done in this country. So Romania is a, this is a typical scene. We would ride out to the set and you know the farmers, the, the peasant farmers would be out in the morning driving their horse carts. Uh, they'd be chopping hay. They'd, they'd take a, a rest in, in the field and then in the evening they would gather the hay up and take it back to the animals. So we would see that whole cycle every day on the way to the set. This is Brian Pohanka. Um, I know George remembers Brian fondly. Uh, Brian is, uh, was a, uh, a consummate historian. I always thought of him as a national treasure. He had a, ma a mind that um, was so full of detail and interest and not just in the Civil War, but so many things. He spoke fluent French. Um, he, he just was a very interesting man and he, he, he and I and another fellow named uh, John Burt were invited to go to be the consultants. And that happened through Don Troiani, the, the painter. As many of you may know his work. Troiani was um, tapped to, by the film company to, uh, sh to lend his uh, original uniforms so that patterns could be made from them um, to make uniforms for the, for the troops. And uh, uh, Brian spent, he wasn't there through the whole filming. He was there. Um, I think he was there for like three or four weeks and he had other obligations and, and went home. This is a photograph of Brian and I taken there. Again, a Civil War uh, tintype um, that is very haunting. It kind of uh, has the feel of, of really being there. Brian passed away um, well, two or three years after the filming. He had brain cancer. And um, even at the time of the filming, he had already lost an eye to the cancer. Uh, was recovering, but unfortunately it, it came back and uh, he passed away. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the film Cold Mountain um, focuses on um, the Battle of the Crater or the explosion of the mine, um, which happened in late July of 1864, where Union troops, um, there, there was a stalemate around Petersburg, a very uh, difficult stalemate and bloody and uh, some uh, Pennsylvania miners proposed that they would dig a, a tunnel underneath the Confederate works and load it with powder and blow it up. And that plan um, went through the chain of command and uh, they were given a, a go to do it. And, and they did it and, and um, as uh, those of you who, who know the war uh, know that um, the explosion was successful but the follow up was a fail failure. A lot of Union troops lost their lives by charging into the, the crater, the hole that was made there. Um, after waiting for too much time in the Confederate um, regrouped and um, uh, it was just a disaster when it, and it actually could have been um, a successful uh, uh, endeavor that would have shortened the war. So that, this is gonna be a big part of the, of the Cold Mountain movie. Um, this, is, this is actually, uh, the crater um, being built uh, or dug. And you can see those little white lines up on the top right. Those are what, what's supposedly left of the trenches and the traverses that came through. And this is the hole. And down on the bottom, those sticks that are sticking out of the ground, that, um, that is uh, the shaft of the mine after uh, the remnants of the shaft of the mine. So, uh, this is the uh, crater being dressed. They would uh, come out and, you know, place, uh, you know, debris of battle everywhere. The black was uh, spray painted every day by laborers because it would wash away or break down and they, they wanted it to look charred. So, and, and I don't know if you can see um, from the right side, just above the, the man there, um, it poured rain for days and days. And when you have a big thing called the crater and it slopes down, what's that gonna turn into? It turned into a lake. So it was a really big problem for, for filming um, and that had to be pumped out daily and they had to build a platform in there and cover it with dirt. It was, it was a big problem, but eventually they got the shots that they needed and you would never know that that was a problem. This is looking from the union lines over to the Confederate lines. And, you know, as a consultant, when Brian and I and, and John got there, one of our first problems was the guard towers with the flags, you know, one, one good union artillery, shot, and there were plenty of good batteries um, by that time in the war, could drop that tower, you know, in a matter of minutes. But the directors, um, the director one, and this is the thing about directors and why films aren't always authentic, because 
a director is an artist and he's making his view of, of, of the story, a visual view, and he needs to key off of things uh, so that people understand. So he wanted these towers so people understood that, you know, it was a fortification and there were flags flying and, and those kind of things. And, and you know, we, we put up our best arguments at times, but sometimes we just had to walk away and, and give, give him the, the director, who's the artist, the, um, the nod to go ahead, even under protest. So this is, we climbed up in one of the towers and this is looking out um, in the, uh, you can see the, the trenches and the, the big guns. And um, there's a stand of trees there. Those are all fake. Um, that was one of the sets that um, was used during uh, night scene, but the trees were just uh, trees with plastic leaves on them. Um, the magic of Hollywood, what, what can you say? I mean, it's amazing. You don't see that at all in film, but you can see how vast this piece of land is and way in the distance is the uh, is the uh, Union lines where some of the where the uh, charge commenced from. They built a lot of things that were never used. This was a destroyed house uh, based on a Civil War photograph. Um, it was great. You could walk into it, and there was wallpaper on the walls and bricks and debris and burned things, but uh, it was never used. Neither was the barn to the left. It was never never appeared in the film, and these were all built specially for, um, fil for filming. Once we finished the crater filming, we moved um, uh, up north into Transylvania and filmed the uh, scenes that were uh, from the home front in North Carolina. And again, these were all, all built. I mean, this was all built uh, according to um, the uh, set designers. So the log cabin, they, they studied American log cabins and outbuildings. Um, they studied, um, to the left are crops. There, there's um, um, electric wire there because the deer would come and eat it. So they wanted, they had to put electric wire there until filming started um, so that they did have crops in the field. But you see a, the barn back there, it's built just like a, an American barn, um, the worm fence. I mean, it was truly unbelievable to be up there and see some of this stuff. They built a whole town of Cold Mountain. This is the, uh, the Castle Ra uh, store. Um, this is the town under construction. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty prop like, you know, the the bricks were just big panels that they would put on with an impression of bricks, and then they would paint them and age them. Uh, there were a few places like the store um, that in the church that you could actually walk inside, and they were completely furnished. Um, this is a production shot. Um, it looks like it could be anywhere in the United States, but let me tell you, every person in that in that scene didn't understand a word of English. So it was, it's like a, it was like a funny thing to be there and be seeing, um, you know, portrayal of your country in another country. Um, but it, it's, it was a beautiful set uh, as well. It was really well done. Uh, they had a lot of props. This was a dead guy prop. Um, uh, these were mannequins that were, uh, they were thousands of dollars. They had glass eyes and wounds. They never appear in the film, but they were around. I saw them. Uh, they just didn't get their close up. Um, so, but they were, they, they were available for it if needed. Um, they, um, they redid, um, re, refabricated a lot of the, uh, the flags and insignia. And again, this was based on uh, Don Troiani and Brian Pohanka's work. Um, the second uh, Pennsylvania artillery, heavy artillery, made a charge into the create into the crater as infantry. So this is one of their flags being painted. Um, this is a little bit of detail from the 57th Massachusetts flag. And if you saw these at all, they just blew by really quick. They went by the camera, but I was impressed by the attention to detail. Um, and so I took some shots of close-ups. And this is in the prop department. Um, and this was one of those moments, um, uh, you know, as a Pennsylvanian, here's a Pennsylvania battle flag, uh, which is done really well. It looks just like the Pennsylvania battle flags. Um, it happens to be of the 100th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteers, um, which was from Lawrence County, where I grew up. And this is a regiment that I collect uh, photographs from and other, other pieces. And I, I knew they were a big part of the crater battle. But to come there and see that they were going to be included um, in the uh, in the in the film was really a, a 
really thrilling for me, so thrilling that I didn't see the mistake in the flag. And I, as I'm talking, I wonder if you do. If you look at the line that says 100th Regiment, P-E-N-N-N-A, Vols. <laughs> so you never see it in the film, but, um, and I didn't see it until it got out on the set, but uh, it was, I wish I could have brought that home. It was really, really kind of cool. Uh, the extras were from the Romanian army. Um, they used um, several different kinds of troops. There were paratroopers there, uh, mountain troops, and, um, and uh, just kind of your, your uh, draftees uh, were the third group that they used. The paratroopers were elite troops. They were the ones that, for, uh, for the most part, these guys all had rubber muskets and rubber bayonets, but the paratroopers had uh, reproduction, reproduction muskets that fired, and they're the ones who are doing the firing in the, in the movie. Uh, the others just had, as I said, um, had plastic uh, rifles and, and you know, they're so far in the background, you don't see them. The temperature was about 90 to 100 degrees when we were training them. We trained them through the manual of arms. We trained them um, in the formations, marching by the flank. We trained them on uh, 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 columns of divisions and columns, columns of brigades and uh, try and arrange them in regiments so that when they made their charge, they were stacked um, as closely as, as we could do to the, to the original. Uh, these are some of the soldiers. You can see the, the guys, the berets or the paratroopers. Uh, and they were, um, they didn't get paid any extra. In fact, these guys lost money because during the summer they could make extra jumps and they would get extra money. So they, they didn't always want to cooperate with us. They felt like they didn't have to. And they, they, we were using en enlisted men mostly. Their officers would march them out in the morning and turn them over to Brian um, and, uh, and myself and John, and then we would be their commanders. And we, we kind of came at it a little strong. You know, we yelled military orders at them and we told them, you know, you're not doing this right and that right. Until one day, uh, one of them came back and he was all black and blue, his face, and he was, you know, not looking real good. And we asked our interpreter, you know, why, is he hurt? Does he need help? And they said, no, uh, you guys yelled at him yesterday and the officers thought he did something wrong. So they beat him up in front of everybody so that people wouldn't um, wouldn't uh, break out and do things they weren't supposed to do. So it's something we we couldn't really um, affect. Um, and from that point on, we were careful not to single out anybody or or make those kind of comments. But it, that's what life was like uh, over there. Here they are dressed as Union soldiers, uniforms based on Don Triani's collection. That's the um, our second artillery flag, the heavy artillery flag there. Um, you see artillery chevrons, the, the corporal on the right has color bearer chevrons. And these are all things, you know, we had a part in, um, in doing and um, trying to focus on the authenticity of the film. Uh, these are the same guys dressed in their Confederate uniforms. And uh, these uniforms too were um, patterned after the Troyani collection. Um, some of it they didn't do really good, but, but in the background it, it worked out, it worked out uh, fine. And you notice uh, we're drinking bottles of water. They had constantly supplied us with bottles of water. And when, when it was over, I asked um, one of the supply people, the Romanian supply people, how many bottles we would actually use because they were, they were dumping them in a big trench and we're going to just cover them over with dirt. And he told us that we'd use 2 million bottles of water during the filming, um, which is unbelievable. So here's a shot inside the crater. Uh, of the Union troops who've just charged in uh, and they're attempting to climb up the wall. You can see on the right, there are troops climbing up the wall. There's a camera position uh, right there. So they're trying to get, these are, these are stuntmen that are on the wall actually trying to get up there. Uh, but they wanted this crush of humanity in there uh, for this very uh, terrible scene that, um, that uh, was very violent. And um, one, of the, one of the things they did, um, they wanted to make the, uh, the atmosphere dark. They wanted it to be a dark day and cloudy. So they have these, these pots called Dante's and they burn uh, diesel, diesel fuel. And they, they burn so much diesel fuel that it blackens the sky, the smoke. And there are like 30 of these surrounding the crater. And you know it's a huge source of pollution, but um, 
I couldn't imagine them doing this in California, but in Romania, they were able to do it. And it really created a, a distinct look of uh, darkness um, on the set for that scene. Here, here you can see some of it. Some of them are, are burning. Uh, this is a Troy Any painting in the in the crater. Um, you can see um, you can see the the uh, U.S. colored troops are, are in the trenches, and they're uh, in the uh, uh, the Confederates are uh, you know coming out in in numbers and re repulsing them. Uh, this this is what um, this is what the charge was like. This is John Burt, my colleague. Um, as they were charging, he would be yelling, run, 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 and uh, just trying to get them to look excited, not look at the camera, and uh, um, to keep the, to get the, the, the aura that we were looking for. Uh, this is a Tom Lovell painting of the crater. I've always loved this painting. Um, it kind of shows the uh, futility of the fighting that's there, Confederates on the rim, Union soldiers um, below being uh, just uh, shot down. Um, as they were standing. One of the camera positions here, um, the, uh, you can see um, it's in one of the trenches. These are, this is called a, a B roll. They take a lot of photos to, um, to kind of slide in and, uh, you know, add, add to the action. Um, so this is a B roll shot um, and the, the action is happening up ahead there. This is one of the, uh, pretty um, violent scenes in the film where uh, Jude Law, uh, the character of Inman, jumps in the crater to rescue his friend Oakley, uh, who, is, um, who has uh, fallen in and he's uh, been wounded. And um, that's a stunt man with a bayonet there. Um, if you look to the right of Oakley, um, uh, these Union soldiers, it's so densely packed there that they can't fall down. And there are accounts that, that state that, that some of the bodies were just uh, being held up by the crush of humanity there. Um, it was a hard day to watch. It was a emotional, emotionally a tough scene that just attests to the acting, how good the acting was. And I didn't know till years later, um, well, I found out years later that the, the kid playing Oakley, he was about 15, is, is the kid on um, NCIS uh, New Orleans. He's the actor that plays on NCI. I can't remember his name right now, but he's, he's that uh, actor with the Southern drawl. Uh, here's um, some of the filming. You see a camera in the center. There's Jude Law laying on the wall. Um, stuntmen are, have started to climb up and uh, everybody on the bottom is just kind of waiting. They're, they're blocking the scene uh, for the scene um, to, be fill, to be filled. So here's a little bit of movie magic. Um, this is um, in, in the beginning of the uh, crater scenes. Jude Law is uh, kind of sitting, seemingly all alone, um, thinking about Ada, uh, his girlfriend, um, um, and just pondering his situation. And you see, um, you know, he's acting like he's all alone, but there's all these people around and they're, they're blowing smoke. There's a cameraman, there's a director, there's a sound guy. So it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing they can put themselves in a zone and really, really carry this off. So what they did was that crater that they're in was like a, it was a special set and it had a hinge in it. And they had that hinge connected to a crane. And they just simply said, you know, uh, 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 ready, go. And the crane started to lift the, 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 the setup. And then all the pieces inside start tumbling forward. And, you know, this is, then they blended in later with the explosion and the smoke and everything. So it just really looks, looks kind of, looks kind of dumb when you look at it like this, but when they weave it into the film, it's, it's really amazing uh, movie magic that, that happens. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up. I have just a couple more here. Um, this is from God, this is from uh, Birth of a Nation. And when I talk about authenticity, this is one of the scenes that Griffith did really well. It was the assassination of Lincoln. He built Ford's theater. He, he rebuilt it to scale. And um, and you know it just if you could have been at Ford's theater, this is what it would have looked like. You can see the presidential box up there. The president's been shot and the crowd is kind of reacting, but it is one of the uh, highlights of, of the film as far as 
of authenticity goes. So are you blown away by history? This is a scene from Gettysburg. Um, if you are, if you're a history person like uh, George and myself, um, we would invite you to come see more. Uh, you could come see me at Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in Pittsburgh. Uh, because of COVID, we're on limited hours right now, but we are taking tours. We have a great Civil War collection, um, and we have a collection that goes from Civil War to Iraq, Afghanistan. We have seven medals of honor on display. Uh, so I would invite you to come. And George, will. Uh, uh, my, my um, email is at the bottom, michael at soldiersandsailorshall.org. And of course, George represents the Hagen History Center. And uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about that. And um, with that, that's all, folks. Michael, that was tremendous. Thank you so much for going through your experience, sharing uh, the behind the scenes look at Gettysburg and uh, Cold Mountain and giving us the history of Civil War on film. Uh, before I turn it over to George, who's going to ask a couple of questions to get us started, I'll remind folks tuning in live here, they can leave questions, comments in that comment section below on the JES uh, post right here for this event. If you have a question, have a comment, leave it there now. We're going to do our best to get to that before we wrap up. Uh, after Michael's wonderful presentation here. But of course, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast, we still welcome those questions. Uh, we'll make sure Michael gets them. We've got that email address. We'll make sure we share it with all of you. George, over to you for some starter questions, please. Sure. Uh, this is an interesting one, Mike, because it came up on a uh, uh, web page last night as I was reading a uh, Civil War web page. And it's about the uh, uh, Shara trilogy, the three books that were done uh, Killer Angels, which is what Gettysburg was based on, and uh, the uh, first and the last one, um, Gods and Generals, which was produced, and Last Full Measure that wasn't. Um, and we, I know Gods and Generals um, was a bit overproduced and was a bit of a flop at the, uh, at, at the box office. Um, but the questions came up last night about, uh, what about the Last Full Measure? Is it ever going to get made? Well, the, uh, the, the trilogy is written by two different people, as you know. Um, Michael Shara wrote um, Gettysburg, or Killer Angels was the original title. And his son, Jeff, wrote the, uh, the other two, Gods and Generals and Last Full Measure. And I read a quote after um, Gods and Generals from Jeff Shara that said, the Last Full Measure will never be made. Um, apparently, uh, he there just wasn't enough interest. It was, a, as you said, a flop in the box office. It does have a following, but um, you know these are these are uh, these are projects that have to make money, and um, it's just at this point in time, it's not going to happen. So, Michael, I'm going to jump in here with an audience question uh, we've got, and uh, you did such a wonderful job. I, th I think with you know, and not only do you have uh, on the ground experience with those two films, Gettysburg and Cold Mountain, but it's so interesting that one is filmed in the location or near the location where it took place, one is filmed very far away, a totally different very country, far. totally different continent. This person is asking uh, because they acknowledge, and we had a program here uh, with the Civil War Roundtable about black regiments. And, and they're noticing that they didn't see any black soldiers uh, in, in Romania. And of course they acknowledge they were a part of the crater, uh, crater experience of battle. What were the Romanians doing to capture that? What, were the, what was the director doing? What were the crews doing? How, how, did, how, did, how did you work through that part of history and film? Yeah, there was a there was a a pod of uh, African actors. They weren't African Americans. They came from Algeria. Um, the production company uh, had some kind of connection, or else I actually don't remember if they were Algerians who were working in Romania and they, you know, somehow um, put a call out and were able to get a dozen or two of them. And um, they they you do see them in the film uh, here and there. Um, and there's one scene where, um, where a United States colored troop, a black trooper is uh, fighting, um, fighting uh, the, the Native American guy, you know, these two cultures that are, and that, that uh, fellow was Jude, Jude Law's um, man, you know, he was the guy who took care of Jude, he was an English, he was English, and, uh, and he, uh, he was in on that, uh, that filming, and you know, it was funny as they, uh, those people don't know the history of it and, and you know 
the, the uh, United States colored troops played a huge part in that, in that fight and suffered badly. So, you know, there was an attempt made uh, and you do see them, you have to look at them uh, sprinkled through the film. And that's certainly something we can go back and check out and look for again. When we rewatch Cold Mountain, uh, I'm going to turn to Gettysburg with another audience question. Uh, Michael, one of the things you talked about was uh, sometimes we had we saw rubber bayonets. Uh, other times we saw actual steel bayonets. I think I recall part of your presentation. You were on the lookout for people running in case they accidentally stabbed each other or themselves. But here we're looking at cannons. And this person is says uh, she has always wondered how did they get the scene in the movie Gettysburg where the Union cannon went off in the face of the Confederates trying to breach the wall at Pickett's Charge? How did they capture that? Take us behind the scenes. I was there. I saw it. I was part of the discussion. So um, the, the, the gentleman who owned the cannons was a name, guy named Charlie Smith Gull. He's a, a, a big cannon collector from central Pennsylvania. And they had Charlie, you know, and, and the stuntmen and the, and the, the directors, and we all had this huddle, and, and the question was asked, how much powder can we put in the barrel to make it look like it's going off, but it's not going to hurt anybody? So, you know, Charlie said, oh, you know, you know, a couple spoonfuls ought to do it, and they, they, <laughs> they, they tested it. They put a, you know, a few spoonfuls or half a cup in, and they, they had the stuntmen with their big shields, you know, and, and they did a test, and, you know, it was just like, when you're standing there, it just was a... <laughs> like that with a lot of smoke and fire. So the stuntmen went, we, we can do that, you know, let's do that. So they, they put a, there was a ramp, like an air ramp down uh, when they would get to that point and the gun went off, they would blow them backwards. But they added the sound, they, they added some more smoke in there, they added some more fire, uh, but no, no people or animals were hurt in the filming of that, of that scene. And that sounds super scientific, a few spoonfuls of powder and we'll see where yeah. this goes, but that's awesome to know that that's the story behind that. As we're almost out of time, George, I wanna turn it back to you and give you the final question here before we sign off uh, after having such a wonderful presentation. Uh, those folks in the comment section, Mike said, great job, great presentation, they're Thank grateful. You. I know we are too. George, over to you to close this out with one last question, please. Real, real last uh, question about the future of Civil War. Uh, film history, uh, you know, uh, the history of the Civil War in film. Um, you know, we are living in a different political atmosphere as we were in the uh, 90s or early 2000s. Uh, what do you think about the um, future of filmmaking? Will there be more Civil War films? Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I hope so. Uh, I think that the film would, would have to explore different topics than a lot of the a lot of the films that are that we've talked about, um, Northern themes, um, African American themes, um, Lincoln, uh, the right script um, that's accurate. Uh, you know, historical films do make money and, and they run in cycles. So it, I think with the right script and the right focus, you know, we have to relook at how we've been portraying the war, and, and hopefully, some director or some script out script out there is going to meet that uh, requirement and, and hopefully be produced and um, be out on the market. Thank Mr. You. Michael Krause, thank you for your time, energy, efforts on this research, sharing your firsthand experience here with us in a partnership event between the Erie Civil War Roundtable, the Hagen History Center, and the JES. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that's what George was saying as I was about to cut him off. Apologies there, George. <laughs> And of course, thank you to all of you watching along at home, uh, tuning in for this live event, or anybody watching or listening, catching a later broadcast when we replay these, we'll share information on where to find that. But before we do, uh, George, for folks looking to connect with you in the Hagen History Center, just again, uh, can we remind uh, where should we point them to, or if they want more information on the Erie Civil War Roundtable, uh, where should folks tune in to find you, the Hagen History Center, the Civil War Roundtable? Well, uh, they can go to our website, eriehistory.org, um, look under staff, see my name, and uh, send me an email. That's the quickest way. Uh, we also uh, currently have our um, 1892 mansion open, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. God only knows where we're going to go with COVID. So um, the idea is that we do have limited visitation, but we have eight new galleries that we are finishing um, a um, million dollar project and 
do a lot of really good history, and I hope to open everything the beginning of June, only a year late from where we had originally planned. Thank you for that update, George. We appreciate it. Uh, eriehistory.org. Folks, head over there. You can connect with the Hagen History Center, find out more information about the Erie Civil War Roundtable. And Michael, from you, uh, for folks looking to connect with you and learn more about the work you're doing on the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall and Museum in Pittsburgh, again, where should we point them? Uh, we have a website, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall, uh, soldiersandsailors.org. Uh, and you can reach me by Michael at soldiersandsailorshall.org. Excellent. And I will echo one final comment here. Fantastic presentation. Very well done. Uh, thank you for you tuning in and sharing that. Uh, and Michael, thank you again for your time, energy, and effort in recapping your firsthand experience on Civil War in film. Uh, folks looking to get more information about the Jefferson Educational Society, both upcoming programs and past discussions uh, available for on-demand streaming, please head to jeserie.org. Uh, there you're also going to find a whole range of publications from timely reads on current topics to reports, essays, and more. And of course, be sure to find us on your favorite social platform. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. On behalf of the Erie Civil War Roundtable and the Hagen History Center and for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.